the uh, the media and the Democrats really are in sync in their lack of knowledge about history, in their contempt for the president, in their over the top rhetoric and in their propaganda. And there was a propaganda piece in Politico, as there often is. It's a left wing so-called news site piece written by a fellow by the name of Bill Scher. And uh, he basically says, and the title of his piece is, Republicans have an Alger Hiss problem named Marlia. Marlia. The arrest of an alleged Russian spy has conservatives running for cover. Here's what they should do instead. I'm not running for cover. Are you running for cover? No, I'm not running for cover. And we're going to bring back my buddy, Professor Paul Kengor of Grove City, expert on the Cold War and activities before and thereafter to talk about this. So we'll give a little history lesson to this fool of Politico and to all of us. But just so we understand, Alger Hiss was not a Russian. He was an American. He was working for the administration of Franklin Roosevelt. And he was a spy. He was assisting the Kremlin. That is, working for the Soviet Union. This woman is a Russia Russian working for the Russians. Now, Hiss had a very high-level position in the State Department and as an advisor to FDR and was involved in the Yalta negotiations in which, as I've explained before, basically half of Europe was ultimately surrendered to the uh, Soviets and Joseph Stalin, who killed tens of millions, but whom FDR affectionately called Uncle Joe. Alger Hiss played a direct role in this. So Politico's so-called reporter, contributor, whatever he is, compares Alger Hiss to this Maria Butina. Why? Because he knows most of his readers are stupid and they have no idea who Alger Hiss is, was, or otherwise. And it wasn't just Alger Hiss. There were many more, and we'll get into that too. A whole spy ring that was exposed, and partly exposed with the help of Richard Nixon, which is one of the reasons why the left has always hated Nixon, and the Un-American Affairs Committee. So this writer begins, alleged Russian spy Maria Butina was arrested just a few days ago, short of the 70th anniversary of the last major accusation of Russian infiltration in America's political system. When on August 3, 1948, Time editor and ex-communist Whitaker Chambers publicly accused former high-ranking State Department official Alger Hiss of being a Soviet agent. Rattled Democrats, including President Harry Truman, handled the fallout poorly, hesitating to distance themselves from Hiss and unwittingly feeding a conservative narrative that they were soft on communism. See, it's always an attack on conservatives and patriots and so forth. Republicans are now having their own Alger Hiss moment. This is where this guy gets bizarre. Butina's alleged efforts to ingratiate herself with conservative movement organizations and the Republican Party. Now we know she met with certain Obama officials. I wonder if they'll update this piece. Hello, I said now we know she met with certain Obama officials. He goes on shows that Russia's interest in Donald Trump is not an operation focused on one man. As explained in the Justice Department affidavit in October 2016, Butina reported to her Russian mentor that Republicans are for us and Democrats against. This is not just about one seductive spy or even one president. It's about how intertwined Russia and the Republican Party are becoming and whether the Republican Party is willing and able to disentangle itself. Is the Republican Party entangled with Russia? In what way exactly? By defending Trump against these outrageous allegations, not a single scintilla of which is supportable? You mean the Republicans who have voted to increase defense spending? You mean the Republican administration that's taken certain severe steps against Russia where the Obama administration wouldn't? Hiss was convicted of perjury in 1950 for falsely denying in his 1948 congressional testimony that he gave Whitaker Chambers confidential State Department documents to be delivered to the Soviets. Interesting back then, isn't it, that people were actually prosecuted? 
He served 44 months in prison, then spent the next 42 years maintaining his innocence. Ever after, even after, er, er, intercepts declassified just before his death strongly indicated Hiss was a Soviet agent for years. And by the way, the Democrats supported Hiss, many of them to the end. Claiming, no, 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 of course he's not a... uh, Of course he wasn't a Russian spy. Shortly before his fall, Alger Hiss had risen high enough in the State Department to serve as Acting General Secretary of the United Nations during the 1945 San Francisco Conference that finalized the International Organization's charter. When rumors of his Soviet ties prompted his resignation at the end of 1946, his reputation remained strong enough for a Republican, John Foster Dulles, to engineer a smooth transition into the presidency of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. His guilt, how come he's not talking about the Democrats? His guilt, while hotly debated for decades, left a lingering stain on the Democratic Party and on liberalism. No, it didn't. Did it leave a lingering stain on them? They do all kinds of crackpot stuff. Does it leave a lingering stain on them? He's just trying to set up Trump and the Republicans, making it difficult for the party to win the public trust on matters both foreign and domestic. If Republicans handle their Alger Hiss moment as awkwardly as Democrats did, they face a similar fate. What Alger Hiss moment? Why was Hitch such a touchstone for the Cold War era? Because for much of the left, he was an honorable man who served 14 years in three government departments during the Roosevelt and Truman administrations, only to be smeared in a wave of anti-communist hysteria. He wasn't smeared. Somebody had a scent on the guy. For the right, he was proof that communists were crawling throughout our government and the liberal Democrats should be suspected of harboring secret anti-American agendas. As Whitaker Chambers wrote in Witness, by the way, a great book, if you haven't read it, when he fingered, hissed, and aimed at communism, he also struck out the forces of the great socialist revolution, which in the name of liberalism has been inching its ice cap over the nation for two decades. That's what Chambers said, and he was correct. Now, once served time, even though he was never convicted of espionage, the right had the upper hand in the argument. Now, see, see how a liberal writes and thinks? The right has the upper hand. The left has the lower hand. No, the problem is progressivism, statism. The problem was FDR. It's not the right having the upper hand or the lower hand. But this guy has to create the scenario to act like Donald Trump is facing an Alger Hiss moment, and so are we. No, we're not. The case marked the beginning of the post-World War II ideological fault lines that would shape American politics during the Cold War. The dueling testimonies of Chambers and Hiss to the House on American Activities Committee riveted the nation. The relentless pursuit of Hiss made a young congressman from California, Richard Nixon, a rock star in his party before there were rock stars. Days after Hiss's conviction in 1950, Senator Joe McCarthy infamously took the anti-communist crusade to the next level, waving a long list of names he dubiously claimed were Communist Party members working in the State Department. Isn't this similar to the Democrats, waving their lists around? Accusing people of colluding with the Russians? They must have something on Trump. Isn't that the next line, the new line? The Truman administration was blindsided, though it shouldn't have been. The FBI had been investigating Hiss in 45 and 46. And Secretary of State Jimmy Burns and Undersecretary Dean Acheson were fully aware, though Truman may not have been. That scrutiny led to Hiss's quiet resignation, and yet Truman condemned the 1948 hearings as a red herring that was serving no useful purpose and slandering a lot of people that don't deserve it. After the conviction, Acheson, now Secretary of State, remained loyal to his longtime friend, Alger Hiss, Whatever the outcome of any appeal, I do not intend to turn my back on Alger Hiss, said Atchison, citing the Gospel of Matthew for good measure. All Truman would offer was less dramatic, no comment. Now their posture, he writes, was politically devastating, especially since Alger Hiss's case overlapped with the communist takeover of China. Truman and Atchison lost China, conservative Republicans thundered. Well, they did, as a matter of fact. One Republican senator even speculated that Hiss had shaped the State Department's China policy. The 1952 Democratic presidential nominee, Adlai Stevenson, suffered as well. In 1949, he'd given a deposition for the perjury trial in which he said Hiss had a good reputation and that he hadn't heard any speculation of communist sympathies. 
The Republican vice presidential nominee, the newly famous Nixon, hammered Stevenson for bad judgment. The man at the top of the ticket, General Dwight Eisenhower, campaigned with McCarthy and charged that communism had poisoned two whole decades of our national life. Stevenson won just nine states. That's not why Eisenhower won. It may have been a reason, but it wasn't even the primary reason. Dwight Eisenhower in 1952 was hugely popular, and the Democrats tried to convince him to run as a Democrat. And he said no. No, he was the conquering general. He was a hero. The cruel irony was that Truman and Atchison were no softies when it came to communism. They were the architects of the anti-communist quasi-militaristic containment strategy after World War II. Boy, this guy's a lib. A policy both credited for ultimately winning the Cold War. Oh, right. And maligned for goading the U.S. into these messy Korean and Vietnam wars. Hardly evidence of communist control of the State Department. Is there any doubt that there were communists at the State Department or in the uh, FDR Truman administrations? There were. I mean, these same leftists who insist that Trump is all tied up with the Russians ignore the facts, as we will discuss in 10 or 15 minutes. The Truman administration received little contemporaneous credit for containment at the time, thanks to the triumph of Mao and China and the unpopularity of the, inclu- of the uh, inconclusive uh, Korean War. Not much Truman and Atchison could have done about those events. Yeah, right. But they could have taken the Hiss scandal far more seriously. Now, why is he getting into all this? Well, he tells you why. Fast forward to today. We have evidence of a Russian spy infiltrating the conservative movement of the Republican Party in order to influence U.S. politics and foreign policy. We have copious evidence of Russian meddling. Here you go. In the 2016 election to help elect a Republican president who has proceeded to frequently parrot the Putin line. Interesting, though, he doesn't mention that Obama told everybody to stand down. What's that all about? Surely our conservative elder statesman, who for years crowed about his, wouldn't repeat the same mistakes as Truman's Democrats, right? Anyone should have learned political lessons from the Hiss affair. It should have been the fervently anti-Russian yet pro-Trump conservative commentator, and then he does a hit on Hugh Human. Goes on, the typical Republican reaction on Capitol Hill was to welcome Trump's grudging, not-so-credible walkback from a few of his Helsinki comments. On the Butina case, we mostly hear silence from conservatives, including from Butina's main mark, the National Rifle Association. Though Fox News host Tucker Carlson spent three minutes with the Washington Examiner's Byron York downplaying the charges. And some far right wing voices are even thanking Russians for their participation in American politics. They saved us from Hillary, after all. It goes on. Even among Putin critics, flirtations with Russia don't enrage. Uh, Conservatives today the way they did 70 years ago because we're not presently in a titanic struggle between communism and capitalism. That seems to threaten the American way of life. Of course, at the time when Hiss and a handful of others lower in Roosevelt administration were part of the communist underground, so-called, in the 1930s, the Cold War had not yet begun. And during World War II, America and Soviet Union were allies of convenience. And it goes on. You get the point here? The end, he says, Soviet communism is dead, but Putinism lives and is all too often echoed by Trump and his loyalists. Republicans have a choice to make. Repeat the mistakes made by Alger Hiss's defenders out of short-term political expediency or live up to the honorable example set by Whitaker Chambers, even if it means taking the chance of joining the losing world. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, this what's-her-name who has infiltrated the conservative movement in the Republican Party, and I might add, met with Obama officials, and we don't know the full extent of that because Mr. Mueller hasn't helped us with that, nor have others, is like Alger Hiss? Really? Well, we need to pursue that a little bit more deeply than Politico. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin'. 